As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI. And use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 151. What, what? Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, who can sing every song sung on Saved by the Bell, Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog. So stop searching and just match with Indeed. So ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you wanna hire fast, you need to go where the talent is. You get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would wanna use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. 
Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What's up, everybody? Pat Flynn here, and welcome to session 151 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with me. This is so cool, and I just want to thank you all up front really quick because we are at episode 151. We had an amazing first 150 shows, and I cannot wait for the next 150, which start with this one with a great friend, Lane Amon, whose name you might recognize if you've listened to the podcast before because she was featured in episode 37, so quite a long time ago, a number of years back, and she's done a lot since. But just to refresh your memory, you might have heard me talk about a success story from somebody who was making six figures in the scrapbooking industry. That's Lane, yes, and she still is doing such. And she's helping herself do that by doing virtual conferences. She's putting on very, very successful and very profitable virtual conferences. So that's what today's episode is all about. And this is something that I think a lot of you who are listening to this, this might be your aha moment. This might be the light bulb going off on your head. Maybe you have an audience already and you've been been serving them as, be- as much as you could, can or have the ability to right now. But then you know this virtual conference thing, you're going to hear what it's all about, what the pros are, what the cons are, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of pros for sure. And actually, coming up next month on April 24th, me and Chris Ducker are putting on a virtual conference. It's sort of like a hybrid virtual conference, but live conference. The live conference is being streamed online, and there will be interaction and things like that. So if you want to check that out, you can go to onedaybb.com. B as in boy, so one day bb.com slash live to check out what me and Chris have to offer you there for April 24th. But let's get to this episode with Lane. It's incredible, just so much information, just like she brought last time. And uh, we're gonna hear all about how to put on a virtual conference. Here she is. What's up, SPI community? I'm so excited to bring back somebody who I've referenced probably more than anybody on the SPI uh, blog and podcast. This is Lane Amon. You might have heard her in episode 37 of the Smart Passive Income podcast. Lane, welcome back to the show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So we posted that episode together of us in episode 37 in April of 2012. And it is currently January 2015, so nearly three years later. I'm sure a lot has happened since, and I know a lot has happened since because we have emailed each other and I wanted to bring you back on to talk about some of those things. So why don't you get us all up to date from where we left off? Sure. So in that episode, we talked a lot about my niche business, which um, my my primary business at that point was in scrapbooking and around um, teaching online classes and running virtual events. So that um, at that point, I think my business had been around for about two years or so. And so now I'm you know, I'm well into my fifth year. So I guess I would say at that point it was about three, and now I'm at about about six years in business. Right. And I have to thank you just first of all b- before we go on for that episode because it's so inspiring to a lot of people. And a lot of people say to themselves before getting into this business or some type of online business, they say, "Oh, you know what? I don't I don't know what I could do. I I have these hobbies, but I, I you know I just don't think it's possible." And I'm like. Check out episode 37, Lane Amon, Six Figures, Scrapbooking. Need I say more? No. And they listen to it and they love it. So if you haven't listened to that episode, listen to Lane in that one. But let's see what happened uh, since then. Yeah. So um, so the scrapbooking uh, portion of my business is still chugging away, still a lot of fun, still a lot of stuff to talk about with scrapbooking. The industry as a whole has changed a lot. Um, a lot of our magazines have gone away. Um, we have more people doing scrapbooking in different manners, like photo books and, and preferring to keep it all online via blogs and things like that. Mm. But because my, um, my model was really not based on any particular type of scrapbook and I've really been able to evolve with the industry. So I'm scrapbooking stuff is doing great. And, um, over the last year or so, I've rolled out a new portion of my personal, um, my personal passions, and that's in the area of productivity and mindset coaching. Cause I would get all these questions from people just like you do. Um, how'd you do that? How do you get this done? How do you balance, especially, you know, having three kids and running the business and all, mm-hmm. all, you know, how do you balance it all? How do you do it all? And uh, I really started diving into that. And so that's something that I've been developing over the last six months or so. And it's been a lot of fun. It's really, it's fun to take that message um, that I talk about in scrapbooking in terms of 
things not having to be perfect and, you know, get it on the page and taking that in a different way, same philosophy to a different audience. So it's, it's really been a lot of fun and I've really enjoyed it. I love that. I love this, the, the journey that you've gone through and, and congratulations to you on this new path. Although it's sort of an, it's not like you left the old one, but you just started a new one, which is really cool. Exactly. The old website that you talked about in that episode was layoutaday.com. Is that the, still the best one to get it's information? still where everything is, layoutaday.com. Yep. Okay. And then your new one about productivity. Yep. Just laneamon.com. And people might want to go to the show notes for that because it's kind of hard to spell. Yeah. <laughs> so. We'll do that. I'll give you the, the link to the show notes at the end of this episode. But for those of you listening, what is this episode about? This episode is going to be out uh, about how to put on a virtual event. Because, Lane, you've done a number of these. And I think a lot of you out there, you know that you might have an audience that an event would be perfect for, but you're maybe too scared to do an in-person event, or maybe you want to work up toward it. Well, a virtual event is a great way to go. And actually, it could even be more uh, profitable for you because you don't have to have people fly in and do all this stuff. Me and Chris Ducker are doing a a live in-person slash online event uh, later this year on April 24th as well. So I'm really interested in this information too. We want to put on a good event for people watching in studio with us in person and also those watching online. So tell us about your first experience getting into sort of putting on a virtual event. What gave you the idea to do that? And how did you go about putting that on? Sure. So first, let me define what I mean when I'm talking about virtual events, just to distinguish them in people's minds from from other things out there. Thank you. And um, you and I have talked in the past about webinars and um, kind of these standalone one to two hour events that could be termed virtual events. Um, I was thinking more that today we would be talking about these larger scale events, more like conferences. Was that was that kind of the angle you wanted me to take today? Absolutely, yes. And thank you, thank you for defining that. A webinar could be seen as an online event, and uh, I've called them that before for things like Let Go Day and other things. But yeah, this is like you want to think about this as a bigger event, conferences, potentially having guest speakers come in and that sort of thing. Exactly, exactly. So that's ex- exactly what the way I describe it is like a conference that I produce online. And it typically can span anywhere from five to six hours to two days, uh, the ones that I do. Um, it conceivably could be much longer than that. I, I have found that to be kind of the sweet spot for me with a preference towards the one day. For my virtual events, I'm I'm producing, it's like Lollapalooza or, or you know, um, Jingle Ball or something like that, where I'm bringing in a lot of different quote unquote performers and having them perform on my stage. So I really, I, I describe it like I'm the Bill Graham Presents, it's the Lane Amon Presents, where I'm um, working with the talent and arranging the schedule and setting up the infrastructure. So those instructors or speakers need to just come up, come in, show up, do their thing, and they don't have to worry about anything else. By the same token, the attendee doesn't have to worry about anything else. They know what they're going to get beforehand. And working between those two um, critical parties or critical stakeholders or shareholders is really where I see my job making sure both of them have a fantastic time and achieve their personal goals. And that's what differs, I think, between um, producing an event and, um, and being in an event. Because you and I have both been at New Media Expo where we show up and they tell us what room to go to. They give us our badge. We show up. The microphone's there. You know, it's all set up for us. Mm-hmm. And we don't really think about who had to do that? What time did they have to get there? Right. Did the sound system work? All that kind of thing. Um, I, when you produce an event, you're the fairy behind the scenes who's flying around like Tinkerbell, making sure all the magic dust is where it needs to be so the whole thing goes off correctly. So when you do it well, it is magic. It really is. You can create this event online that people feel like they know you, they feel like they know the instructors, they feel like they know each other, and it can be as fulfilling, if not more so, than going to a live event. Mm. And the, there's a lot of reasons for that. So let's talk a little bit about why you might want to do a virtual event versus an in-person event. And yeah, you spoke a little bit about that in terms of um, the risk factor with having to reserve a hotel. I've been working with a hotel locally here in Scottsdale about an event I want to put on this summer for my scrapbooking crowd. And they require a huge deposit. 
Um, they want to know they're going to sell X number of rooms and that we're going to spend X number of dollars on food and beverage. And I am on the line for that if it doesn't work out. Hmm. And we're talking to the tune of, you know, ten to $15,000 and we're only working with maybe 40 people. If you want to put on an event for hundreds of people, you can just imagine and scale that up from there. It is not an inexpensive proposition and you can, you can lose a significant amount of money if um, you know there's an airline strike or there's some kind of other world event, snow, um, people don't show up, those rooms don't get used, your credit card <laughs> as the producer <laughs> is on the bill for that. So you're putting on an event for about 40 people and it's costing yeah. about 15 grand to yeah. reserve yeah. that space. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And I actually am, am negotiating with some other people and, and looking at some other things because I don't want to do that. I'm not at the point in my business where that is a, an insignificant amount of money. Um, and we haven't done it enough for me to be able to be 100% certain that I can pull in those people. There's always those, those unknowns. So with the virtual events, you're talking about holding it online in a, in a virtual room. Those can run anywhere from free if you go with something like um, one of the free trials on one of the webinar platforms up to, I use a really high-powered one. It's Cisco's WebEx Event Center um, that can hold 500 or more people in it. And that is several hundred dollars a month that I pay. But compare $300 to $15,000 and you can see exactly <laughs> right there <laughs> that, yeah. that there's a huge benefit. Um, then there comes in the, the issue of travel. Uh, my market in particular, I have a lot of women, a lot of moms, and it's difficult for them to get away. And I found overall, no matter what market you're in, um, people don't necessarily want to travel if they can get the same experience without having to get on a plane, without having to stay in a hotel room, it just lowers the barrier to entry and it cuts their costs down. Right. So, um, so that's significant as well. Uh, another thing is bringing in international audiences. I have routinely people from um, Asia and uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Hawaii, Alaska, um, Europe, all, and not to mention North America, all in our room at the same time. The time zone's a little bit of an issue, but it's nothing compared to asking somebody to fly from Australia up to uh, America for a weekend event. Mm -hmm. So you pull a wider range of people in. And that's really exciting as well to get that worldwide international experience. Very cool. So we've got the cost side of things. We don't have to worry about coffee. Um, is the room too cold? Is the room too hot? We don't have to worry about um, how many hotel rooms. Wi-Fi connection. Wi-Fi connections at $15, $20, $50 a person. Um, it gets insane. The numbers can really go up very, very fast. So cost is obviously a huge issue. More appealing to people because they don't have to travel also, you can pull in a huge uh, range of instructors. So on some of my events, I've had as many as 15 instructors. Uh, the smaller events might have five to six. But I'm able to pull in these instructors, again, from Australia and from Canada and from Europe who might not be able to travel or I might not be able to afford to pay them to come here to, to show up in an event. But it really takes an hour to two hours of their time versus asking them to invest a whole weekend or more if they're coming from further away. That's so huge. That is huge because I can honestly say when I'm promoting my events, you have never seen these people be together before. And uh, oftentimes when you go to live events, it, sometimes it's kind of the same, you know, the usual suspects. We see a lot of the same names and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you can really create a unique event. And that is spectacular as well to, to pull in people that um, instructors that people might not have heard or might not have heard together is really allows you to present something unique. That's really so that's cool. really wonderful too. So I'm keeping track of notes. I'm keeping notes here on certain questions about these sort Great. of things. Why don't we pause there and you ask some questions? Okay, let's 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 stay on guests right now. I think it's really cool that you could get anybody in the world to come in uh, if they're available, of course, just for those short periods of time when they would, they might have to be presenting and stuff. Um, how do you reach out to those people? I think a lot of them might expect to get paid for some of like their time. Do you pay them for their time? How does that sort of deal work out? I do pay my instructors. I think that's really critical, not only to get quality instructors, but also I feel better about 
the event if um, because just because I think they they they're professionals they deserve to to be paid for that. So um, for the scrapbooking events that I do. Um, Typically, there's a. It, it depends on if I'm working with. I've worked with companies before, like manufacturers, mm-hmm. who become sponsors of the event, and then there's a different arrangement. But if I'm working with an individual instructor, so Pat Flynn's going to show up at our next scrapbooking event, and oh, he's going to be teaching us how to add audio to our scrapbooks with these cool recorders that you know he's invented somehow. So or macrame, I can do macrame. Exactly, you're going to be teaching right macrame on scrapbooking pages. <laughs> Then um, if you're showing up as an individual, you become an affiliate for the event. So you promote the event to your audience, and then I have an affiliate share uh, situation where every ticket, kind of standard affiliate share, where every ticket you sell through your link, um, you get a share of. Some of my instructors are newer, so they may not have an audience yet, Mm -hmm. and I give them the option of getting a flat fee instead of the affiliate commission. They're still required by contract that I have an agreement with them. I still require them to promote mm-hmm. because that's critical. Um, but I do give them the option of, of being able to just take a flat fee. And then I actually um, basically purchase its work for hire and I purchase sure. their content from them. So that lets me get some really new um, faces who might say, you know what, I don't think I, I have more than five people read my blog. But I would love to do this for you, Elaine, and I've got some great stuff to teach. And it lets me discover people. And you'll see people who you might not have seen elsewhere. Again, it's really, it's really exciting when I can share those, those um, instructors with people. That's really cool. Do you have any tips for anybody looking to just find help on coordinating with these guests? Do you use specific tools or apps to organize that? Do you have any tips on perhaps order of your guests to make sure people leave with you know, excitement and, you know, do you, do you pay attention to where people are in their, in your program? Um, I don't pay attention to where they are in the program as much as I pay attention to the content. So I tell them when I invite them, I give them, um, an initial invitation via email, or if it's, uh, somebody that I know, um, more casually in terms of like, we've got a friendship, then the invitation wouldn't be as formal. Um, but it just say, Hey, you may have heard about these events I produced. We've been doing them for these many years. Um, I've worked with instructors like yada, 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 you know, name drop some people. So they will know that I'm, I'm legit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm planning our next event for like October is our big, um, big broad scrapbooking event, the biggest one in terms of content that we have. So, um, if I would love to talk with you about this, as um, see if you might be interested in teaching. It typically requires this, this, and this in terms of the requirements. Um, uh, let me know what you think, and uh, and I'd love to give you more info. And then I'll send that out. And that I pretty much have a hundred percent response, yes or no, on that. Like I very rarely do I not get a response. Mm-hmm. I'll either get a response that says, This sounds great, send me more info, or I'm sorry that we're I just can't do it that weekend, or I'm I'm working um, with a company that requires me to be exclusive to them. I can't teach for anybody else right now. Um, but uh, I typically do get responses almost a hundred percent of the time, I would say. Nice, nice. Thank you for that. And in terms yeah. of the events that you put on, you said you do like a two day event. You Mm -hmm, said, mm -hmm. how many guest speakers would you have for about a two day event? I've actually moved down to one day events only because I've found that people prefer them, um, in terms of both in terms, it lowers the cost point for the attendee Mm. and it requires less of a time commitment. So all my events now are one day and they might range from five to eight instructors. And then a two day event would be um, would be anywhere up to fifteen or more, um, fifteen to sixteen, and each instructor has a one hour time slot. So um, that's kind of how I gauge the time. So fifteen instructors would be fifteen hours of class time. Perfect. And then, how soon in advance of the event are you contacting these guests? I started contacting people for the October event. I started lining up some of the people I knew I wanted to return as soon as last October was over. So I have a couple of oh, people wow. already on the, the, the hook. And sometimes I'll ask them in front of the audience. <laughs> if it's somebody I know, I want to have them come back. I'll say, hey, 
um, did you guys love this? Wouldn't you love to hear so-and-so? Wouldn't you love to have Pat come back and teach us on, more on advanced macrame yeah. next year? And then everybody <laughs> says, yes. And then I will immediately follow up and say, I got you down. You know, they, of course, could still turn me down. But, uh, right, right. but you know, hey, you got three or 400 people in the room saying, please come back. We want more. I mean, how do you say no to that? So, <laughs> um, but the, the people who are newer I, I'm starting basically now for October. So um, again, with travel, you have to you might have to book people a year further in advance. Right. Or because this is online, I won't have a finalized schedule till probably um, April, May. But it'll be a good four, five, six months beforehand, and that's built out over time. The first time I did this, I did not have that much lead time. <laughs> it was more like. I think I'll do this in a couple months. Let's, you know, let's, let's put on a show. So, um, so people who are thinking about doing this for the first time should not feel like, well, it's already too late. I'm already way off game because I, I don't have, you know, I haven't started. So you can, you can pull it together more quickly online. Yeah. I think me and Chris for our event happening in April, we've given, we gave ourselves about six or seven months and we thought that was plenty, but it is plenty fast as far as the time that's going by. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, we're, we're on top of it, but we're feeling it too. So we're, yeah. we're really excited about that. You can get more information about that at one day bb.com. But a couple other questions uh, about that. If somebody's, if somebody's really interested in this, which you probably are by now, and what are the first steps? Is the first step to get guests or is there something that happens before that in terms of structuring your day and what it might be like. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first step is to, to decide on what's missing in your industry. What is your market need that it's not getting? And for the scrapbooking market, for me, there used to be a ton of local scrapbook stores. There used to be tons of opportunities to hear teachers teach. They would travel around the country. There were a lot of scrapbooking events. Those are going away. The scrapbook stores are going away. The magazines are going away. People don't have that place to connect and to see these um, these scrapbookers that they may have previously learned from in magazines or in other um, in other formats. And so, I wanted to produce something that would bring together the best of online education with the best of in-person education to provide that community, that connection between student and student and between student and teacher. And that's what I was going after, that experience. And for another market, it might be completely different. If you're in a niche where, let's say, there hasn't really been any standardized education, um, it's a fairly new um, like the food truck industry. I bet there's not a ton of food truck conferences out there. And if somebody's running a food truck, they may have a hard time getting away. Mm -hmm. That would be perfect for a virtual event. It is something we've actually talked about yeah. internally. There, <laughs> there's, there's one main conference uh, and then a few sort of satellite conferences around that, but nothing online, that's for sure. So. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what you need to decide is what can I do that's going to add to my industry's um, overall uh, development and what's going to be different. I, I, I never want to do something that's like an also ran or a me too. I'm always trying to come up with the next thing that's new for people. That's just my role. Um, even if you want to do something in an industry where there are a lot of online events, what can you do that's going to be different? And that's where I think people should start. Love it. Love it. Okay, great. We're talking about a lot of great stuff here. Um, you mentioned, people to people, so students to student mm -hmm. and student to teacher and the, mm -hmm. the interaction. I think yeah. that that's one of the best things about going to an event in person is you get to see them, you get to to, to shake their hand and mm -hmm. hug them at a cocktail hour, which is, I don't know, some people get really crazy with that. <laughs> but that I feel is something that's missing in the online virtual event space. How do you truly get that interaction in a virtual room? Mm, it can be missing. And this is why I go opt. This is one of the reasons why I opt for the, you know, super duper extra stratosphere powered event center. And that was a WebEx event <laughs> Web center, right? Uh -huh. And okay. they also have a meeting center or a meeting room or something. I can't remember, what, what, remember the name of it, but they do have a lower, um, less, less function, uh, lower functionality room at a lower price tag. Just for me, I needed the event center because of the number of people I have. Yeah. Um, it allows the chat in the room and not audio chat, but but it's got a chat box. 
And so that chat <laughs> will go so fast. So to give you an idea on the size of my events, um, on our webinars that we have, we call them scrapinars. Once a month, <laughs> we host a free one-hour scrapinar. We might have 2,000 people register and close to 500 people show up. Usually, it's about 25% who show up live. Mm-hmm. Wow. For the paid events, we could have anywhere up to about 500-ish people um, register and we'll have 200 to 300 who, sh- who are in the room at any given time. A good number of them are chatting with each other <laughs> and yeah. the instruction is going on um, on one part of the screen and they're in the room talking about like, where'd you get, you know, I've been looking for that punch or um, do you know any, you're in Alaska, I'm in Alaska too. Where's, where's our closest Michaels or, you know, there's just tons of chat going on and they love that. So there are some web rooms that do not provide for that chat. Mm-hmm. So that is critical for, for my audience. Um, another thing is that we host, um, uh, we call it the pre-event PJ party. It's just the night before. It's when the instructors all show up to do their mic sound checks. We have like a two-hour open session where all the attendees can come in too and just get used to the room. We'll usually have some prizes. We'll do a little bit of getting to know you. Where are you? Where, you know, just chatting. Wow. That's really cool. I love that idea. Yeah. It is so fun because a lot of these people have been dying to connect with other scrapbookers and they haven't been able to because either the area they live in is it's not uh, realistic for them Mm -hmm. Um, they just, maybe they're shy. Um, they might go to a scrapbook store, go to a, a, a class somewhere, but it's not as freeing and open. And you know how open people feel when they're behind their keyboard. Um, but open in a good way where they feel right. like they can make a comment and, and feel like they're on even ground with everybody else. Um, we also do a Facebook event page. So beforehand, so people can register and say that they're coming and, um, then meet other people beforehand that way. Um, we just try to look at little things like that to make those connections between people. Um, there's a couple other things we do that are kind of specific to our, our industry, like creating a Flickr gallery so people can share their products afterwards and show what they've been doing and what they did with the content they learned. Um, things like that. Love it. This is golden information, by the way. And thank you so much. This is actually helping out me and Chris so much. (laughs) Good. It's Um, a pleasure. I love it. Yeah. No, I'm going to have him listen to this audio even before it goes live because we're right (laughs) in the middle of of planning. Yeah. He'll, uh, uh, anyway, this is, this is so cool. Okay. You mentioned uh, tickets a couple times. Mm -hmm. What technology are you using to serve those tickets? You know, I know that GoToWebinar has an integration that will pull in your email list and there's a lot of different um, uh, functions that go to webinar has that I'm not using currently. I just set up uh, a registration page and um, people just, it, it's, it's operated through PayPal and then they get subscribed to an email list and then I stay in contact with them via an AWeber email list. And that's where I send them all their information. We create what we call a call guide, but it's, I don't know why we called it. It's one of those things that we've been calling it the same thing for three or four years. So now the name's stuck. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's the program. We have a written PDF document that has all the classes, the class description, um, the link to where they'll go, the schedule of the day, what they can do if they have problems accessing the web room. Um, All that information is in that, again, we call it call guide. It's more like a program. Um, and we send that out beforehand so people can print that out if they want or just have it on their computer. But we communicate with them through through email, through an email list. Perfect. Thank you. In terms of ticket price, how do you best determine the price for, an, for a virtual event, which probably has a lot more upside because you're not paying so much for right. the venue and all that stuff, but can you have too much of an upside? How do you determine what that perfect (laughs) price is so you get the maximum amount of sales and also profit? Right. A lot of it is going to be experimentation, just like pricing. I mean, when it's virtual, um, you can, there's a lot more of a spread, a lot more of a spectrum that you'll see. I have an idea of what, at this point, after I've done a dozen of these over the last three or four years, I've got a pretty good idea of what my hard costs are in terms of um, you know, I know my monthly costs for the web room. I know what mm-hmm. my 
my uh, payment processing costs are. I know what my VA is costing me. Um, I know what kind of support I'm going to need. I hire somebody, and this is critical. This is a sidebar here, but this one's big. Um, I'm going to write it down as a tip also because uh, I'm sure at the end you'll ask me anything else. But having staff in the room to help you out, just somebody, some kind of customer support person who can help you out. Um, I know what all those costs are, so I know what I need to make on the event um, to cover all that. But when I first started, there was a lot of experimentation. I didn't know what people would be willing to pay, and this was new. So I always kind of position it as when I'm doing something like that, hey, you get to get in on the ground floor. I am charging way below what I know this is worth because I know it's a risk for you. But typically, like we've got an event coming up at the end of January, and the 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 on the page like retail rate or whatever is 149 for seven instructors, but we offered that as low as 59 if we could get people in in December to, to sign up for that. So they were saving like $90 off the registration rate just, just to get those early people in because it was a brand new event. We've done events like it before, but it was a new, um, a new topic within the larger scrapbooking uh, arena, and we weren't sure how it was going to play with people. Mm. So um, we wanted to get a, a, you know a good base of people in to make to cover those hard costs, and then we've charged more since then. So um, for the big event in October, the ticket price, the registration price, whatever you want to say, will be about one ninety nine, and then there will be um, specials running up before the event, depending on how soon beforehand people, people sign up. And sometimes we do, instead of dollars off, we'll do a bonus. Like you buy this and you'll get this for free, limited time offers, um, getting people to commit earlier, um, just because we want to know we're going to have X number of people and we can't really sell out. So, um, so we just want to cover those costs and then everything else beyond that is going to be profit. So you say 199 and you Mm -hmm. say that sometimes you'll get 500 people registered. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys can do the math, but that's, you know, pretty much six figures for one event with only 500 people. I mean, that's not, I mean, that's not that impossible. No, it isn't. And especially if the instructors you've chosen are good promoters. And that's always a mixed bag too. And sometimes I weigh the person with great content and a small reach versus the person who's got a great reach but maybe people have, have seen a lot of them. So, Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it might, they might not, you know, they have that bigger reach, but they might not, uh, they're all great instructors. I would never ask anybody who wasn't, but maybe they, they've been seen a lot of other places. So that's, that's great. I mean, that's awesome. I think this is going to be very, very motivating for a lot of people. Now, in terms of promoting and marketing the event, you had mentioned having some of your speakers help to promote or or all of them, which I think is really smart. What else are you doing to help promote and market this event? And, to start this off, how soon before the event are you actually promoting it? So right now we have an event at the end of March and just today, and I should have done this about a week or two ago, but uh, it got done today before the middle of the month. So I'm counting it as early January, which was my (laughs) goal. (laughs) Um, I've created the interest list. So I'm creating a list where I can start talking about the event and say, Hey, if you're interested in this, Sign up here because we're going to give you a special deal. You'll be the first people who get to get in and we'll release all the class names and topics and everything. Um, As soon as it's available, you guys will be the first to know. So I have created that today and I will start announcing. And and yesterday I emailed the people who had attended this event the last two years um, and told them to save the date. So, um, So I'm starting now promoting for the end of March just because... Um, December, you can't really promote much for the coming year. So ideally it would be about three months just telling people, Hey, this is coming, starting to talk about it. Um, but with December, we push that into January, um, for the October event, we'll start hard in, in August probably. So, you know, two months, two, two and a half months, I would say. Okay. Um, again, it doesn't have to be the same as if people are trying to get a good flight or get a, a hotel room. Right. Um, you know, people who go into South by Southwest probably have their <laughs> their plans firmed up <laughs> a year and a half in advance. So, right, right. 
And then after the interest list, how do you promote? And I know there's, you know, obviously scarcity is huge in online marketing, but with a virtual event, it's not quite as easy. Do you do, and it sounds like you already kind of answered this, uh, price increases over time leading up to the event? Can you give us sort of a little bit of a structure on how that works? Sure. And again, this is going to depend on your market. And something I should say on pricing too is is being able to justify whatever your price is against um, a competitor or against the next likeliest trade-off. So I position mine against a live event. And I say, you know what? You don't have to fly anywhere. You don't have to get a hotel room. You don't have to buy food. You don't have to get a babysitter. You're saving in all these places. And if you took a class from each of these instructors, it would easily be 30 or $40. So for a seven person event, I'm positioning myself against what would have cost $280, $300, not counting flight and all these other things. Mm-hmm. So when you do that, then 99, 150, that's, it's a bargain. And I record everything. So people get access to all the recordings as part of their registration package. So you go to a live event, it's in one ear. Maybe you captured some of it. It's out the other. Maybe you get an opportunity to buy the recordings for an added fee. Um, But this is all in one. You can go back and watch this over and over again and as many times as you would like. So, So I really have it positioned well that they're getting these benefits at a lower cost. So then it seems very reasonable. Yeah, I love the idea of the recordings. I've been a part of conferences before where they sold those in addition to and I've also been a part of conferences and as an attendee of ones that just give it to me. And I, I love being able to go back and, and rewatch something or knowing that I perhaps missed something. I can go back and get that later. Or it just makes me feel better even during that whole day event, knowing that I can miss something and be able to get it again later. If that's right. included, that that's huge value add right there. Oh, yeah. And I hate being as a consumer. I hate being nickel and dimed. Pay for parking, pay for this. Pay. <laughs> I would rather have it all built in and and feel like. Once I pay, I'm done. So I love that. Um, so we were talking about promotion. So yes, yeah, so the instructors will promote and I will create a whole swipe file for them of, um, you know, you could call it a, 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 I don't know, resource guide or whatever, where I'll give them sample blog posts. I'll give them sample Facebook status updates. I'll give them sample tweets mm-hmm. and say, you know, just stick your affiliate code in here. And I also will send that to, out to my affiliates as well and say, here, this is going on. This is this is what we're doing, and um, you know this is content for you to to use to promote. So we'll do that um, for our last event in October. I also did a series of chats on Spreecast, and if people aren't familiar with that, it's basically like a Google Hangout, but a little more um, secure and, and and structured, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it's free pe- for people to attend. They just need a Facebook login. And I would just do informal chats. I would say, hey, tell us about your class coming up. Tell us about, um, you know, the coolest thing that you have discovered about scrapbooking in the last year. You know, just informal talks that might not, content that might not be covered in their class, Mm -hmm. um, but lets people get to know them. And that that was a lot of fun. And then also last time we did an experiment, we did a Kindle book where I had each instructor write a little bit, just to answer a series of questions about their class and about their scrapbooking style. Um, and this could easily translate over to any industry. Um, you know, what's your best business? It's like the questions, you know, the best business uh, tip. If you had to start over with no money, what would you do? I mean, it could be anything like that for any industry. But then I just compiled them and we gave it away for a, a significant period of time on Kindle and then it became a paid like a 99 cent or a dollar 99 ebook or something like that. But that was real. That was different. That was something people hadn't seen in our industry before. And so it got some interest there. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. In terms of the, your affiliates, what percentage of the ticket sales would you say come from affiliates? Mm, I would say that counting the instructors, I would say 70 five percent maybe wow, okay so it's a good number it's a good number but there's also a significant that are coming from me directly it might not it, it's going to depend on the event this new event we're doing in january i probably have a higher portion direct to me mm-hmm. um but yeah i would say it's it's a well over half and then what program or programs are you using to help manage that because i know that is a big question that a lot of people are going to have right i'm in the middle of 
transitioning, but right now I'm using eJunkie, which is great because it's very inexpensive from my end. Yeah. My affiliates tell me it's not as easy for them to use. So I'm looking at some other options now because um, I would like to make it easier for them. And I can attest to that on both sides as well. <laughs> Because I've used eJunkie for a while. Now I'm getting familiar with Gumroad. I know there's some other affiliate-specific programs you can use, some uh, that are specific for WordPress. I mean, we it, 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 maybe in the future, once you land on one that's good, you can come back and I can just insert that in the show notes or something for everybody if you find one that works for you. Yes, that would be great. Have you thought about, because Chris and I are using Eventbrite to, mm -hmm. to manage our program, and there are fees involved with that, but a lot of things are taken care of. They even have a built-in affiliate program too. Uh, you could check out that that. Uh, Eventbrite page actually at one day bb.com slash live. Have you used Eventbrite before or something like it? I haven't. And that's something that I've been considering just because it does handle, it handles certain tasks that then, then I wouldn't have to. My concern with it is that my scrapbooking audience isn't always on the forefront comparatively to internet marketers or online business owners. They're not at the forefront of technology. Mm. So if I'm already asking them to try this web room thing, I didn't want to put up too many barriers to entry, but I think Eventbrite is getting to, to the point now where it is more, um, more widespread. So people are comfortable with it. Um, it, I, I just didn't want people not coming because there were too many technological hoops for them to jump through. Yeah. Love it. That, and, and, it's, I'm really glad you said you just knew that that was the case for your audience. Um, you should absolutely always know who your audience is and what kind of people they, they are and what they respond to uh, as well. So that's really smart. Um, final question here, unless you have anything else to add afterwards, Lane. This has just been amazing. Thank you again for sharing all of this. This is, this is going to – some people are going to build businesses in the next year using your model, and this is just going to change their lives. This is so great. Thank you again. What are the biggest mistakes that people will make – so that they know they can avoid them. <laughs> There's always going to be a technolo technological glitch, either on the payment side, your WordPress blog goes down the day you open up registration, your email list goes, you know, disappears. There's always going to be something that goes wrong. And I remember the first one that I, uh, the first event I did, and it was in April of 2011, first big one like this. I remember, and I'm not a crier at all. I was <laughs> oh, like no. in tears because the web room, I wasn't using WebEx at that time. I was using this web room where they had sold me on these capabilities that didn't exist. So they said, oh yeah, we can handle it. So I was having people try to log in and they were getting bumped back out and oh, it was no. horrible. It was horrible. And I didn't have a plan B because it was the first one I'd done. So just expect things to go wrong and expect to have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. So I always have, at this point, have 47 different ways to get the information out, to um, contact my audience, to run the event. Um, I've always got a backup uh, for p basically everything. And just like if I were hosting this at the Hyatt, um, I, I, I'm there to solve those problems. And I remind myself, this is one of those mantras. Mm -hmm. I remind myself that I get paid for those hard times. The times when everything's going easy, I'm working for free. The time I'm earning my money is the time <laughs> when everything's exploding and I have to problem solve and keep, have the calm head. And that has helped me a lot over time. Thank you for that. That's going to help me and Chris too, and everybody else <laughs> out there listening. So thank you for that, Lane. Uh, did we miss anything big? I wanted to mention just two things. One is having staff in the room actively with you, helping you out, because you're going to need links to certain things. People are going to say, you're going to mention something that you had no idea you're going to mention. Maybe it's one of your products or um, something you're an affiliate for, and you don't want to have to be the one digging up that link. So have a VA or some kind of assistant or a friend who's there to help out with that kind of stuff. That's number one. Number two is during the event, I used to teach at the events as well as produce them. Now I almost exclusively am the, the host. And that's how I see my role as the master or mistress of ceremonies where I'm greeting the people as they come in the room and I'm welcoming the, the instructor. And again, playing that role between the instructor and the, the attendee and making sure everybody's okay. It's just like walking around freshening their drinks and things like that. Um, I really take that role very seriously. And again, that's that's my value add because people will tell me, 
um, oh my gosh, you just made it so comfortable and so fun. I felt so welcome, both on the instructor side and the student side. And they feel confident even if something goes wrong because they know I'm there to handle it. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell them that up front. I'll say, you know what? We can't control technology. It, when it works, it's great. We love it. If something goes wrong, trust me, we will make it right. And people believe that because I've shown that to them over and over and they see my face. I'm consistent. I'm the consistent present uh, presence throughout the whole event. And to me, it was too much to try to teach and do that role at the same time. So I chose to take that role of the producer or the host instead. Love it. I think that's a perfect way to end this. Uh, Lane, thank you so much for all of your help and, and information. You said there was two things that we covered, those two things, or was there yep, one more? just the staff having somebody there to help you out. And then and your then role. Your role. Got and it. This is your role, whatever you want that to be. Just want to make sure we got it all, because this isn't like a little thing that's just going to, you're going to put together tomorrow and then it'll be done. This is like a big deal. And I think we've covered a lot of the major points and and uh, even a lot of the smaller ones too. So I think people are well equipped to move forward and, and do this for their brand and their community too. So thank you again, Lane, for all that help. Where can people get more information about what you're up to? They can find me a um, couple of places. Layoutaday.com is the scrapbooking stuff. If you go over there, it's all scrapbooking all the time. So don't expect to find any <laughs> business stuff. So if you don't want a scrapbooking, don't go there. But you can come to laneamen.com and I'll spell it for you now. L-A-I-N ehmann.com, laneamon.com. And that's where I have all my um, productivity, mindset, business coaching, personal coaching, that kind of stuff there, um, motivation, inspirational stuff. And also, if you have questions about this, um, people can always find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash laneamon. And that's my personal page and, and they can track me down there and I can refer them to whichever one of my other pages might be of most interest to them. Awesome. Thank you for offering that. And we'll make sure to have all the links in the show notes mentioned uh, right after we hang up here. Lane, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and all the best of luck to you. I can't wait to connect with you again, hopefully not in three years uh, (laughs) before that. And um, just hear about some even more amazing things that you're up to. Definitely. Thank you so much, Pat. All right. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Lane Amen. Again, you can check her out at layoutaday.com and also Lane Amen. Dot com e h m a n n although probably be easier for you to come back to the blog and check out the show notes to get all the links there you can go to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 151 thank you lane i know you listen to the show you are amazing as always we always appreciate your help just so inspiring i mean you know it's sort of like a, a joke in the internet world to say like oh you know scrapbooking you can make six figures by knitting or whatever I mean, but you're actually doing it and so <laughs> Well done, and I'm just so inspired, and I know everybody else is too, especially for this idea of putting on a virtual event. So if any of you out there are listening to this and are inspired, head on over to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 151. I want to hear what your plans are. Do you think you're going to start a virtual conference of some sort? Well, check it out because all the links are there as well to help you get started. I hope you've been enjoying the free podcast content here. I'm really excited because it's one of my favorite things to do, and I know a lot of you have already taken action from the content that you've listened to on the podcast. And if that's you, congratulations. Just keep going, please. It's one of my favorite things to see. But I also know a lot of you, and a lot of you have been telling me that you've been wanting more. You've been wanting additional information, some accountability, some hand-holding along the way. And so depending on what it is that you're looking for, what I would recommend is actually go to smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. You'll see the courses that I'm offering there that are paid courses, but they're there to help walk you through certain processes. Depending on what problem you have or what issue or what thing you're trying to solve, go there, check it out. You can see if there's a course available for you and where you're at in your business right now, whether you're just getting started and and you just want to make sure you have all the right things in place before you actually devote a lot of time and effort into something. There's a course for you there. For those of you looking to get started with a podcast, there's stuff for you there. And there's going to be more courses there in the future. And how do I come up with those ideas for the courses? They come directly from you. So thank you for all telling me how I can help you better. And if you have ideas for more courses that I can create for you, just hit me up on Twitter at Pat Flynn. Let me know or uh, use my contact page on smartpassiveincome.com. But again, check out and see what's available, smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. That will be continually added to over time. So check it out. Thanks so much.
I also want to thank audiobooks.com. They were actually the first sponsor ever of the Smart Passive Income po- podcast back in the uh, 90s. Not the 90s, like the years 90s, but the 90s in the episodes. And uh, they believed in the show. They were the first one to prove that it was totally worth it to just have these spots here at the end to help pay for the show and to help pay for the people who help put together the show. So thank you, audiobooks.com. And they're back. They're back to sponsor. So if you go to audiobooks.com, they have a, they have a really cool deal for you, actually. Audiobooks.com slash SPI, you'll get to download my book, Let Go, a bestseller on Amazon, the audiobook of that for free. You'll get that plus an additional credit to download any other book that you'd like. Their first audiobook is on them. So if you like the service, you can enjoy a new book every month after that. You also get to choose from more than 50,000 titles, including top rated business books written by leaders and innovators in the field. And uh, they have a smartphone and tablet app that'll help you with all that good stuff. So again, go to audiobooks.com slash SPI and you'll get that special deal only available here. You can only download the audiobook for free here, which is really cool. So again, audiobooks.com slash SPI. Thank you guys. I appreciate your time. And again, these show notes are at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 151. Let me know what you think of the show. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. And I'll see you in the next episode. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I've got one for you. It's called Dirty Money, and it's like a hybrid between a true crime and a business podcast. So hosts Jonathan Small and Dan Bova tell the tales of legendary scammers, con artists, and barely legal lowlifes who stop at nothing to rake in millions. Recent episodes include a man who looted $100 million from his own company. Crazy. Give it a listen. Head on over to Dirty Money right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.